Welcome to this uh, special episode of Searching for the Question Live. My name is David Orban, and rather than having my guest who knows where in the world, it is a big surprise and a big honor to have Rehan Alahwala actually here with me in my study to record this conversation that uh, I'm sure is going to be interesting and fascinating. Rehan, welcome. Thank you for inviting. I'm so happy to be here. It is really nice. Uh, we have been in touch online for a long time before actually meeting in person in Dubai uh, a few years ago. And now uh, you uh, have accepted my invitation because you were traveling in Italy. That is where I would actually uh, like to start. Tell me uh, what brought you to Italy. So I got a surprised invitation from an organization called the Bowl Awards. And they, it's something which I have not heard of before. And what they do is they look out for entrepreneurs and projects who are doing something bold and crazy. Uh, so they seek me out and they asked me to apply and then we applied and then uh, we got nominated like uh, as top contenders for the Rihan school project and uh, and then I came for the dinner party and so to my surprise we won so that's what brought me to Italy. Congratulations. Thank you. And uh, I wasn't there, uh, couldn't uh, Your participate. Friend was there. But uh, yeah, one of uh, one of my my uh, friends uh, was there, and, and of course I also know uh, H Farm, which is the organization that set up uh, the Bold uh, Awards. H Farm is an accelerator in Italy. They are doing wonderful different things. Uh, so let's uh, uh, talk about the Rehan School, which is the winner and recipient of this year's uh, Bold Award. Um, what is it and, and when did you start it? So Rehan School was started in 2011, uh, around 13 years ago, as a way to educate the 160 million Pakistanis who don't know how to read and write even their name. So at that time, um, I was into videos still, and I wanted to use a stupid phone, the $10 stupid phone, preloaded with educational content so that people can just learn how to read and write, at least read in three months, using celebrities as teachers. So I wanted to make content which was viral, which was interesting, was not boring. And uh, so I started doing that uh, for a few years. It didn't go anywhere. Uh, then I met the you know president of Sudan and he said, can you do it for us? And um, he suggested we have 23 languages. I was like, I'm not going to do this 23 times. So I thought, how can we do it uh, where everybody can understand? So I thought of Mr. Beans. Uh, I thought Mr. Beans can be understood by anyone or Tom and Jerry can be understood by anyone. So why not create educational content, which is so much fun that Mr. Beans do it. So I actually went to see uh, Mr. Beans three times. I couldn't find them, couldn't get through his agent. But then uh, somebody said, why don't you do it? So I just did it myself, like Mr. Beans. I made funny videos, uh, like Mr. Beans, without speaking. And uh, that's um, all on the YouTube. This is before, you know, there were smartphones. So there was no 4G, there was no 3G, there was 2G time. And uh, there was no YouTube viral content being possible, or Khan Academy didn't exist. So... Uh, maybe it did, but I didn't know about it. So, uh, after some years, I just let it be because it wasn't going anywhere. I tried my best and slowly, slowly, we kept creating content, but it wasn't going viral. Uh, a few years ago, then, I went to Singularity University. I'm very inspired by, um, you know, the work that they were doing. I've heard about it, so I went and saw in LA, there was nobody there, I just popped in, went around and I saw what they're doing. And I see, I like what uh, Ray Kurzweil and um, Peter has created. So I was like, 
you know, when I came back, I was like, I think the kids when they're 10 to 14, they have, or 18 even, they have the most time, spare in their time, in their lifetime. Uh, what if I could make them problem solvers and ask them to study two hours a day to, um, um, to solve, or to learn how to solve problems? And back then there was Alexa, uh, there was Google, there was YouTube, but there was no AI. So I just made a video. I wanted to open a small little school, 10 people who can just learn. It didn't happen, but finally, and I kept posting and I'm looking for a buy to school. I, buy, I want to buy a school. Around two years ago, two and a half years ago, I bumped into someone who was selling his school. And I bought the whole school. I never even saw where it was. I just bought it. And um, the guy was older and um, it was a very large building with a very giant auditorium. And I was like, this is beautiful. And I just looked on Google Maps where it is, and I was like, fine, let's do it. So I just bought it and um, just let it be for a few months. And I wanted, I, then I went back to my idea of creating this system. But when I took over the school, the, the teachers had ne never used Facebook. The, they had never used the computer. Um, the principal was not computer friendly. Um, so I bumped into these, these problems. So I was running another school already in another town called the Digital Literacy School, which I started around three and a half years ago. I wanted everyone to, when COVID hit, um, we created these courses and books on learn basic digital literacy, because if you can't go out, then you can work online at least. So I, I in COVID, you know, COVID was my most favorite time because I could create content like anything. And uh, I feel like I was literally made for COVID because I've been working on, you know, on, from my home since I'm 13. Um, so I loved it. And I was like, this is my thing. And now people had to go on Zoom. People had to do use WhatsApp. Otherwise, they're like, can we have a meeting? Can we just do this? Can we do that? Where are you? I'm like, I mean, in your phone, call me. Just, you know, I'm, I'm with you all the time. I'm like a genie. So, um, so I, I transferred that guy to our two weeks two days a week to my in this new school the guy was running the other school and then we slowly for six eight months tried to teach digital literacy to our you know um, to our principal to our teachers and it was a very hard job to do um, they would just cut off the internet they would just delete the stuff because they were like I'm some kind of a CIA agent trying to... They were literally sabotaging your efforts. Yes, yes. They, wow. they thought I'm doing something evil because um, a lot of people still think Facebook is bad for you, TikTok is bad for you, you know, internet is bad for you because whatever reason, there's somebody just told them, you know, anything new is always back. I mean, if you remember a few hundred years ago, people were burning books because it was, it was evil, right? So anything new is always evil for human beings. So I don't know why. Um, so, um, fast forward last year, uh, this last year, January, I started teaching. I, I eventually managed to get a few kids, uh, 10 or 15, uh, online from their, from their, from the school computers. And, uh, they would start to talk on the computer. They were, their, their, their parents would allow and some interesting things also happened that, you know, I went out and laid out my plan that this school ended up being in a slum area. So um, one of the biggest problems is they don't have enough money. So their parents earn $100 a month. So, and I was already running another campaign that everybody should earn, 100, earn at least 100,000 rupees a month, which is $300 a month. So I thought, well, these are kids. I wanted them to become a problem solver. Why don't I also teach them how to make money? So I went and started saying, okay, this school will now teach kids how to make 100,000 rupees a month. And there are a lot of poor people in our country, uh, people who don't make enough $300 a month. They make like $100 a month, $50 a month. So a lot of people, a few people actually start migrate to my school, like near my school. So one of the family who lives near the school migrated their kids to my school. Another woman last year brought five, four of her children to my town, to near the city, near the school, and just said, here, just educate them. And then uh, another guy who was 
um, hired initially as a driver. He brought his six kids. Now he's one of our teachers uh, at the school. Um, it, it just just took his life, took its own life form, I think. And um, last year, I was um, I, I I started another project which is called OLPP, One Laptop Per Pakistan, just like the One Laptop Per Child yeah. project. So I want to give now one laptop to every church, every student in my country. So we charge three dollars a month. We take a used Chromebook and we put warranty on it, our own warranty. So if you break it, you throw it, you lose it, we give you a new one. It's like insured. And we charge three dollars a month. So I started this for my school initially and I give every child a laptop. I took some of my money more, give all of them a laptop and now I started seeing interesting because now these kids each of them have their own computer their 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 typing speeding started to increase their productivity the tasks which were given before they were refusing to do anything uh, on the phone on the on, on on the classroom i don't know if they were refusing or the teachers were refusing or who was refusing but now they had their own independent machine and um these kids started to produce content so how do you teach a kid how to use a computer. So I took Canva as a product because, you know, what do you do when you're in nursery school? You 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 give a paper and um, carry-ons and just paint. So Canva is the same. So you just paint, uh, play with the computer. So the task was to make three posts on Canva a day and post it on your Facebook. That took me seven, eight months just to get them to make use of Canva because I'm sure the kids were smart, but the, par the parents, the teachers, everyone was like, no, don't do this. It's bad for you. All that, you know, it took seven, eight months. And then the content started to emerge. And then I started losing more hair and more hair because like they were making me frustrated like anything. I was like, why on earth can't you just make this? We will do it, but they don't do it. They say one thing, but they didn't. Anyhow, last year, March, we gave them all laptops and I said, uh, the Canva posts were coming. Then I said, now you're going to interview human beings, people. And um, if you interview, I'll give you 50 rupees, which is like 50 cents. And if you interview in English, I'll give you a dollar. And now they're like, okay, and you will earn money like this. And then you will pay me installment back for the laptop. That's how you will pay me back for the laptop to start off with because they have to go to $300 a month here. They're not even making 10 bucks. Yeah. So um, it started to happen. I started paying extra to the teachers, the, everyone just was like excited. Oh, we'll get some money just to interview people, just to talk to people. Um, then I saw English interviews starting to appear. One of my other students went uh, my assistant actually went and taught the kids that if you don't understand English, use ChatGPT. ChatGPT came in, by the way, by that time, it was ChatGPT. So you go in, you go to their Facebook, and you you see, okay, you want to interview David Orban, you go to their Facebook, you copy everything which is on their Facebook, put it on ChatGPT, and ask ChatGPT to make up 10 questions. Then you ask ChatGPT how to say this in Roman Urdu. So now they can read it's English, but they're reading in Urdu. When it comes out, it's English, but this, they're, in their mind, it's Urdu. The, the transliteration. Yeah, lit Roman, we call it Romanization. Like, yeah. you, 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 can, you wouldn't understand Urdu, but you could read Roman Urdu, yeah. but you wouldn't understand. The yeah. kids now are reading Roman English in Urdu, which they don't understand. Mm -hmm. But the, the, my assistant said to them, you just memorize this line, and then you display the question on the screen on, on StreamYard. And then you say, wow, amazing, fantastic. Wow, amazing, fantastic. And this, these kids started to interview. And, and some of my friends gave in and they started giving these interviews. And I was so fascinated because these questions were so amazing. Every time these kids were interviewing, the, the person didn't know that they're, they're, they're coming from ChatGPT. They're like, wow, what an amazing question. Wow, what an amazing question. It was so fascinating. A hundred interviews later, in English, these kids started to speak English. 
re and they, I started to understand 60-70% of what these these people were saying. And these kids are taking Lao, you know, a few 5,000, 7,000 rupees a month home. And I'm like, whoa, that's interesting. I never, I never hired an English teacher. And these kids are actually learning to speak English just like we spoke, we speak all other languages, you know. The way, the reason I speak the way I speak English is CNN. Mm -hmm. I was watching it, I was listening to it three hours a day and it turned out that my brain somehow learned it on its own. And that's always been my concept to immerse yourself in whatever you want to learn. It, the brain is very smart, it just learns on its own. That's why I have books like these, but I don't, I've never read a book, but I just keep them there. Maybe the books will do some magic. So, um, now I have some amazing kids uh, who are s brighter, smarter, better than my staff who has been with me for five years. These are just 12 to 15 year old children who are so quick on the IT side, who are so good at the smartphone side. I can, if, I, if there's a new AI website, I'll just give them, can you please make a tutorial for me for this? And three hours later, I'll have a tutorial uh, about this, this site. They will be using it, they will be learning it on their own and they just even make tutorials. So it's like magic um, started to happen. And I found out that once you have a champion in the school, everybody else follows it. So it's like this four mile, uh, uh, four, four minute mile rule, right? So you break a rule once and everybody else says, hmm, it's been done before. So, you know, it's possible. So it, it reinforced my belief that um, we are all self-limiting creatures. We're constantly limiting ourselves to everything. So I was having a lot of fun with all this and another of my students popped in and he was like, um, I'm very frustrated and I, I want to stay with you. I, I said, sure, here's a room, just stay. And then I was traveling, so he's, I moved him to the school building. And he started an online version of the school. He just asked me, can I just start teaching the same online? Because a lot of people are coming from other parts of the country. Can I teach them? I said, sure. Uh, what should I do? I said, no idea. I don't ask me questions. Do what you want. Ask Chad GPT. So the kids started, this guy started doing an online version of the school. Now it's three months. And uh, I, meanwhile, I was just letting these kids be. And they were not good enough to start earning yet. So I went to Qatar, another education conference, met some people, and they told me that there was a London conference. So I came for the London conference. And uh, when I went back from Qatar, my vision started to start to change that, you know, I think I can do much more than this, this $100 or $400 a month. These kids are very interesting. So um, when I went to London, I met some people again, and they said, why don't you open one in London? And I said, who will let me do all this crazy stuff in London? Because in my school, I don't teach chemistry, no biology, no physics, no math. The STEM is out. Everything is out. Just AI is in, computers is in, meditation is in, yoga is in, uh, exercise is in, games are in. We have now a, a Minecraft game room. Uh, we have... Uh, then I, I have a guy who starts who has who's an amazing creator and he makes beautiful looking rooms so we don't have rooms like rooms we have a classroom we have like one of the classroom looks like a spaceship one of the classroom <laughs> looks like united nations one of the classrooms looks, looks like um you're in the future in ai or something you know it's like weird looking rooms and they're like so cool and you go in you're like you immerse yourself in these in these spaces i like it's, it's it's it it turns you on in in learning's mood and then, um, so it's this has been a very interesting year and a half of experience, experimentation. Then the London thing, so I met this guy who it took me to another team and there was a woman who wanted to enroll her son in my school. I was like, hmm. And then I started researching. It turned out that $1,800 a month in London, in Pakistan, I'm charging like, what, $3 a month? I'm like... There's a, there's a business opportunity right there. I need to do something. Even if I charge 10% of 
what they're charging here and I do it online, I can get like 20 students, I can run my whole school in Pakistan. I was like, ooh, interesting. So I started a London version of the school um, and, you know, made another team who was fluent in English, who can cater to the London market. And we have started now a London version of the school. And, and we refined the idea more. So now we have an eight-year school program you get your kid in as what it's called the fifth grade. First year is the fundamentals. We, we teach AI, computers, chat GPT. Annie, Annie came in who, who, Annie's a phenomenal AI, which you can just talk about anything and she speaks back. She doesn't get tired. She doesn't get angry. Um, and by speaking half an hour a day with her, you become friends with her. And then your English becomes amazing because now you're talking to an American all the time. Uh, so you, you, we teach this and then we teach the interview thing that each kid has to do like an, one interview a day and meditation, yoga, all that cool stuff. Sixth grade, we give them a wala. A wala is, you know, like you have uh, zab, sabo, you have in Hungarian, you know, mm -hmm. somebody Peter Sabo, like you're the tailor. So same thing or goldsmith, for example, or ironsmith. So in Urdu, we have a wala. Wala means this is like I am Allah, God, wala. So I'm God wala. I'm like selling God or I'm belonging to God. It's It can be used for both terms. So we started giving these names to kids to identify them because like they're like five Imrans. How can I, which Imran are we talking about? So we start giving them, okay, you're going to do, you're going to work for the next 10 years remember that's why i made the school so i can take their time extra time to make them a specialist so now we are making each of the kid a specialist in one wala water electricity climate change biogas anything any problem in pakistan we have a 100 problem list you have to take a la new last name when you join our school and now we join it for eight years first year is just fundamentals we don't teach you anything special but the second year you become a wala and that's all you learn for the rest of the seven years so year two you have to earn hundred dollars a month which is more than your dad already and uh, when you earn hundred dollars a month 50 percent goes to the school 50 percent goes to you we don't charge fees um, and you have to watch one TED talk every day uh, of your wala so if you're a water wala you have to watch one TED talk about water you have to listen to it, you have to understand it, and you have to explain it in English and in Urdu, and then you tag the original speaker. So if they actually heard David Orban, they're going to say, hey, Mr. David Orban, this is what I learned from you. Can I interview you for half an hour? So they're learning, and they're giving feedback to the original TED Talk speaker, and they're connecting with them on LinkedIn and Facebook, on Twitter, and interviewing them, if, they, if the person gives. They do it 200 times a year on the same wala. So imagine a child interviewing 200 water specialists in just one year. What is he becoming now? And his network is now full of water walas and AI of Facebook, AI of uh, uh, LinkedIn is suggesting, here's another wala, here's another water wala, here's another water wala. Let's connect with them. And now their network is becoming phenomenal. And they are also becoming phenomenal because they're just focused on one problem they're not learning maths or science or blah 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 second thing they do every day is they have to make an ai based video on the wala so they have to now make a prop video on water using ai so they go to chat gpt they discuss with it so it suggests a script they make us use a script go to text to speech they convert the text to vo voice these are 12 year old kids 10 year old kids and then they go to canva and youtube and mix the content and produce every single day a two minute documentary on a problem in water that's task two task one was ted talk task two was now to interview a human being task three is to make a you know video and that's it that's all they do and yes number four now they have to learn freelancing because now in sixth grade they have to earn hundred dollars a month in order to go to seventh grade they have to make hundred dollars a month in seventh grade they do everything the same but they're now more mature more better more quality they've been freelancing for one year they become phenomenal at it so now they have to make three hundred dollars a month 
at 8th grade or level 4, they now have to make $500 a month because now they're more mature, they're, they know more water wallahs or whatever wallahs, they're known and famous and they have like thousands of followers already and they start a startup. So now they start a startup which is related to their wala. They have hundreds of friends who are in that space. They have chat GPT who's telling this is the business you should start. And that business has to be digital version of it, not a physical version of it. And then they work on that business for four years. And then they exit the business for one million dollars at least. So in four years, you, you start it at eighth grade. And by the 12th grade, you have a million dollars in your bank account. If you don't, you stay in the school. Till you get a million dollars, you're not leaving the school till you get a million dollars. How do you how do you get a million dollar valuation? Again, you have AI, you have all the brains in the world in your in your pocket. You have a team of other three kids who are also the same wala. You have me, you have my network, you have your own water network within that network. There's everything, problem, solution, money, everything right there. And you just have to just put it all together. So that's now behind school. So the goal is to at least create a thousand Malalas, a thousand Greta Thunberg, a thousand millionaires, at least, uh, who would actually go out there and solve the problems. And I, when I think about it, you know, I can, I can be an immigrant in the U.S. and I can wake up one day and say, you know, I'll be a governor of California. And I don't need training for that. And I can just go and enroll myself and I can screw up the country just because if I'm a good speaker or if I'm, I'm, I'm famous, I could be the governor. But I had no training on how to be a governor, or how to be a leader, or how to be a connector, or how to network together. Just like in our country, a cricketer came up to become the prime minister. He had no training. So I was thinking, why can't we train Obamas? Why can't we make Clintons? Why can't we make Elon Musk? Why can't we make Steve Jobs? What makes Steve Jobs? What makes a Malala? So I think this will make a Malala. So if you become if you just learn about one problem for the for 10 20 years that's who you become that's what you're trained for just like you become a cricketer a, a, a doctor a, a surgeon an accountant you become a water expert you become a climate change expert you become anything you want to be but you focus on one thing and you start early you start at age eight and you end up at age 18 by the age 18, you already have a million bucks, you already have a name, you already have a brand, You people know you, you have a huge YouTube video content, you have like, you become what I become at 50 at age of 18, you know, it's like, that's that's what Rehan School is basically, so far. And now I was, uh, I started another branch uh, very, with a friend, and he just made a video the other day, like, anybody who is over... What are 10 years of age and wants to come and study with us, you can study with us, but you have to enroll in grade one, grade five. So you can be an MBA, but you have to come back and study at grade five again. If you're ready, we will teach you. So I was like, hmm, I think the world is changing and all of us need to really relearn everything all over again. So why don't I make another vertical just for adults and kids together? And this can be a school of lifelong learning. So I'm, that's something which I will do next. So that because I burned a lot of money in the last three years teaching, trying to teach adults for three months and six months, it doesn't work. I think two years, one to two years is unlearning part. And that's when the learning part starts. Unlearning takes so much more time. And with the, when the children, I'm happy that there's not enough, there's not too much unlearning. But there's unlearning for their parents, unlearning for their friends, unlearning for their aunties and aunts which is a big part of our community thing and uh, so yeah I think the kids are amazing now the adults I, I also need adults to fix problems so I think I'm going to start an adult version of the school same premises same everything uh, so we have now uh, like three physical branches we have 150 or odd students two years in uh, and an online version which is running four classes a day every day right now and uh, that's what we're doing uh, it is uh, amazing because it is part of uh, 
your ability to experiment, uh, which is how I uh, remember having met you on Facebook, where I was very confused at the beginning until I realized that every post you would make was an experiment. And some of them were, were very provocative. I remember you would say, hey, now you go and uh, make Indian friends. You would say to your Pakistani followers, which is, uh, from a political point of view, very provocative. And then uh, you would get, since you have uh, several million followers, you would get a lot of comments, positive, negative, people would misunderstand, but it didn't matter because a few of them actually would go and do the thing that you, you, you posted about. And that is just one example. There are many like that. So with the same spirit, you also approached the, the school and the various iterations that you just uh, uh, described. Now, I think it is interesting that one of the reasons you were able to do it is because no one in the particular city where you started came, an inspector, and said, these are the hundred rules you have to follow. that you have to follow. Uh, you, you, you were free, basically, to, to follow these experiments. Correct. Um, and and uh, that is what you were worried about when you mentioned uh, about London, because you knew that in London there would be licensing and certification and inspection and, and, and mm. everything else. So, I am sure that over the course of uh, the next 10 years, but probably next two or three, the experiment will evolve further. Uh, AIs will become even more sophisticated, new tools will emerge. Um, the, hopefully, the economic uh, engine will also start uh, not only supporting what already exists, but giving even more resources to run more experiments. Um, you mentioned the resistance from families, uh, the teachers. Is it true that when you will be sufficiently su successful, there will be resistance from the regulators as well? Yeah, I think so. So in London, I found that there is a thing called a free school system where you can actually decide 70% of the curriculum, which I did not know that it exists. That's why I started thinking for London. Uh, otherwise, I would never even dare because it's like, I don't want to even mess with these people. It's too complicated. It's like, yeah. They don't want to change. So I don't want to be the guy who wants to do a, bring a bulldozer, bring them down. But it, apparently there is a way to do it in London, which is called the free school system. And then there's another thing in Sweden the same way. There's a whole movement called the free school system where the regulators don't force you to follow 100%. They say, okay, here are the 100 rules, but you can make the 70 your own rules based on whatever democratic methodology, which is, which is what made me allow me to, to actually even try to do this because that's where the you know, Singularity University is not accredited anywhere because exactly. of that same reason. Yeah. And um, and we are also not going to be accredited anywhere. I'm not even going to attempt to accredit it. I found out that you can do a GED exam, um, and that anybody can actually do a GED exam, which means that you're a high school degree holder from the United States mm -hmm. just by giving four exams: maths, science, um, uh, ethics, and I think social studies or something. And you can learn all that with ChatGPT. Um, you know, so it's very easy compared to the regular studies. So I, so we have now decided to get all of our students, once they make the million dollars, at least a GED degree, so that they can choose to, they have some paper so that when they're looking for a bride or you know, you go to your father, to, you know, can I marry your daughter? What did you study? Nothing. Oh, well, no, where's your paper? <laughs> so 
So at least that is what is needed right now for 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 getting married in my country. Also, I found out that they need another certification, but that requires eight other papers. So we will prepare the kids to to do do all that paperwork. But more interestingly and more exciting for me is that these kids are going to become the change makers. These kids are going to be very wealthy. These kids will not have the worries of a normal Pakistani, and they will become a change which you know like i in my last 10 15 years was this is what i was doing anyways i was creating influencers who would do and go out and influence other people the more people i was always looking for right people just like how i connected to you my job for the last 15 years was to find the people who are already doing good work and use social media to amplify them and because they were not using social media properly and my job was to give them a shout out or connect them with more people and connect them with more network so they can actually amplify their work and now i'm applying all what i've learned in my life and in, in doing all this instead of going and looking for them because they're very slow to change so i'm saying you know what i'll just make them from scratch um, i'll make them into influencers and i'll make sure that they, they influence the right way the right thing so the fundamentals in our school is that you have to impact 10 million human beings positively you have to become a vala of something which is very important to fix in the in the world and then you have to make a million dollars um, so that this becomes fashionable this this product becomes fashionable because fashion is what people normally follow they don't follow most people are not not you know wise enough to just follow what is right what is right they they, do, they follow what is a habit what is the culture what is right or wrong but but very few who have read so many books might actually go out and say, we have the IQ enough to we can say we can reject something. No, this sounds wrong. Or I will go and investigate more. Most people say, no, my dad doesn't agree. My father doesn't agree. I was just talking to one of the boys yesterday who um, we hired as a facilitator who is only 18. And he keeps saying, I'm the seventh in my house. I'm the youngest. And they don't let me come here anymore or they keep arguing with me every day because they want me to become a doctor or a government servant a typical last century job designation because they're very poor they don't understand what i'm doing so, but once i produce a few millionaires they will all be like lined up i hope uh, or even not even millionaire even if, if even if our students start to make a hundred dollars a month i think there will be a much bigger line uh, we have only got a few students who have done hundred dollars so far and one of the kids has done $300 this week, and we haven't seen the cash yet, so we're, I'm just waiting. Come on, come on, come on. Uh, I remember, and I don't know if that is still the case, that there were important obstacles for the digital economy taking off uh, in Pakistan with uh, things like PayPal being um, blocked by the regulators and, and uh, also... Um, Facebook Zero, which allowed people to use Facebook without paying for data, created damage because actually uh, those who used it felt that internet was nothing more but Facebook. And uh, going beyond those limits, uh, using Wikipedia or using uh, other platforms, they would need uh, uh, paying for the data and they didn't have money. So this may have been a few years ago. What is the situation now with respect of the virtuous circles that the digital infrastructure actually allows if it is unfettered? PayPal is still not there. Uh, but uh, PayPal is not blocked by Pakistan government. It's, it's, I think it's bad communication somewhere. Um, so PayPal is still not there, but you know I have been running my own business for 25 years. This this year will be 25 years online uh, since 1999. I've been working online since 1980s, 1997 in the U.S. I have um, never lived in the U.S. permanently. I've had my business in the U.S. and that's how hundreds and thousands of people have opened companies now in in the U.S. from Pakistan. So I think. Pakistanis are in so large quantity, 240 million, you know, that's a lot of people. And when you're hungry, there's nothing that's going to stop you. You're going to go crazy, you're going to try hard. 
even if I send out 10 million people from Pakistan, that will change the dynamics of Europe. But that won't change anything in Pakistan because we will probably make 20 million more kids by then. And um, I think with the arrival of AI or the arrival of the smartphone, a smartphone in Pakistan starts for $35 and it's unlimited internet is for $4 a month. Um, with the arrival of Annie, with the arrival of uh, Gemini, I'm very excited that the Gemini will become more and more common in the end of the year with the arrival of the WhatsApp AI. Um, I think countries like, you know, the, the third world countries are about to blossom in a way where we have never even imagined because for 10, 15 years, I've been, I've been seeing this, that the majority of the innovation will come from these people who have never been educated. And the reason is because they don't know how to, they don't know what is wrong. They don't even know the laws of physics. They're just going to do it. They're just going to invent. It's like, it's like the Wright brothers. They did not know that there's the wrong. They just try it. And then that's what is happening. So millions of Pakistanis have opened companies in the U.S., more than Israelis probably, without even realizing what they have done. They're just doing it for PayPal. But actually they have now a U.S. entity. They have now a whole ecosystem in the United States which they can tap into, like I did 25 years ago. And I've been preaching about it to whoever comes to Miami. Another boy who I met 2008, he's also a millionaire now already because I told him to register a company in the U.S. and he started doing business there and he sells all kinds of weird stuff in the U.S. Not illegal, all legally. And so... Sometimes, you know, some things happen with blessing in disguise. So maybe PayPal not being there, fine. Uh, it's not there. It, but it's not the end of the world. The local ecosystem has developed a lot. Uh, we have our own Daraz, which is Daraz, which is an Amazon. We don't have Amazon. India has Amazon. Um, well, Daraz is now owned by Alibaba. Alipay. Alipa, which is Alibaba also, is coming in through another company from, from Telenor they bought out for half a billion dollars. It's, so the local payment system has been solved and it's free. PayPal is not free, yeah. but in Pakistan, you can transfer money to anyone from anyone for free, mm -hmm. no charge. Mm -hmm. And you can transfer one penny. Yeah. So, and it's, it's free. So I, I, I was in Kenya. Um, like M-Pesa. Uh, where M-Pesa is, is uh, universal. And uh, I actually did a kind of a 20 cent transaction when I bought uh, a bunch of sugar cane on the roadside in a slum. And it was exhilarating mm -hmm. to realize that uh, digital money was uh, so pervasive. Uh, so I'm very happy to hear that uh, pod being uh, taken care of uh, as well. Um, now, one of the issues around education is that... Uh, if you let me interrupt, the challenge which Pakistan still has, that the economy size is very small. So the, to become a billionaire in Pakistan is extremely hard. So that's why we're not even trying to do anything in Pakistan. We're trying to do... with Every kid... Is, re is requested not to connect to Pakistanis. You talk to people overseas. You try to earn from Americans. You try to work for, for Swedish, Singaporeans. Don't try to even explain to Pakistanis what you're doing because they won't understand. It will take them three years. It's better to just go to David, you know, go to all the Davids and Tonys and Thomases. Just connect with them. Why? why? Pakistan is only 3% of the planet. 97% of the planet is outside Pakistan. Even though it's the fifth largest country in the world, it's still only 3% of the planet. Planet is pretty big. So why do we have to look within? We can just, you know, migrate to the internet. Migrate to the internet. And, and, and just open up your heads. All my kids have an American phone number. All my kids are the school kids. All my kids are, you know, just, just whatever they need. I mean, virtually, I want them to live in the US. I don't want them to live in Pakistan because you will not earn good money if you live in Pakistan. You can live virtually wherever. You don't have to live virtually in Pakistan. Physically, yes, but virtually, no. Uh, I, I think that is uh, uh, very 
important and I totally uh, agree with the approach. You and I have been doing it for over 20 years uh, uh, already uh, under uh, conditions and, and infrastructure that was uh, less readily available than, than today. Uh, I remember carrying an AT&T calling uh, uh, card uh, so that I could dial American phone numbers or I could be reached uh, rather than just seven, they would have to dial a many, many, many no more numbers, but they would reach me wherever I was. Mm -hmm. uh, and this was uh, 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, and it is important, I think, uh, to realize that uh, this kind of setup still benefits the local economy because they will buy food, they will pay rent, they will uh, have health care, hopefully they will marry uh, and uh, build like a family. So, so they will benefit uh, the local economy uh, regardless yes. uh, and, and build it uh, progressively up. Um, so you are uh, building a parallel education system which sidesteps a big challenge which is that of the educators themselves, many of whom live in a paradox because they are completely aware of their own ignorance about digital tools, while at the same time they are required to be the authority figures that are supposed to know everything. And it is not per permitted for them to say, you know what, I don't know, let's find out together. Uh, the, the, the traditional school system stops them from being honest. Uh, and, and, and also, as you mentioned, changing the mentality of an adult is much harder than letting a kid try things because no one told them it cannot or shouldn't be done. Uh, Pakistan, in this sense, is, is lucky uh, because the demographic pyramid, at least for the moment, greatly favors uh, uh, young people. Um, I don't know the, the percentages, but uh, I would 70% of the population is younger than 26. All right. Yeah, that's, uh, that's great. In Italy, 25% are over 65. 10% well, is under 26. Uh, if, if, if you go out and go in uh, the city or at a restaurant or in the supermarket, wherever you go, except the schools, you old only people. see old people. Yeah. It's, it's really depressing. And, you know, uh, for the first time in my life, I'm getting old. So <laughs> I have to discover how it is. And it is, you know, an adventure by itself. But at the same time, being uh, uh, surrounded by majority old people sucks. So I am uh, thinking of how to make sure from a, the point of view of my psychology and mentality as well, uh, to physically move to countries where there are more young people, because I think it is unhealthy to be only among old people. Come live in Pakistan for three months a year. Okay, I I will think about it. <laughs> I'll give you a house, a maid, a car, everything you need. Just just hang out. Well, thank you. I will. Uh, I asked I Carla will... to do the same. I don't. I think I introduced her to you. Yes, yes, we uh, we. We're... So she moved. I mean, I was like, she. she I asked her to come for a month, <laughs> and she wouldn't go out. <laughs> she wouldn't. Leave. She has her own house. It's four bedrooms, a uh, brand new house. The, she was the first tenant. The rent she pays is $100 a month uh, in an amazing city. It's right outside Karachi. It's a brand new city. And uh, she has a, she has a maid. She has a brand new car. Uh, she has a new podcast center in the, in the house. I was like, wow, Carla, you know, this is amazing. She's thriving. Yeah, and then there's another lady who was approached by one of our students to give an interview. And she gave in. And she gave another one, then she gave another one, and she, she gave 10 interviews. And then I was like, who is this woman? Who is giving so much time? And turn out she is a mother of 11 her for her own children, 
from the same man and I inboxed her and I was like, thank you for giving time to my students. Who are you? And she turns out also to be a space um, uh, adventurist. She has a Harvard grad. She is an investor now in space programs. Her first startup just landed in, on moon with the, with the backup system of Earth data on the moon. And she has now decided to live partly in Pakistan because she finds out that this is an extremely inexpensive and extremely rewarding country because you show up as a white person, you're like a VIP instantly. <laughs> and people listen to you, people respect you, people invite you to their homes, people buy you food. You are like a VIP every day if, as long as you live in Pakistan because they're so rare. Uh, because the bad reputation of Pakistan disallowed people to come to Pakistan in the last 20, 30 years. The whole generation has, has changed. Up till 1978, Pakistan was a very different country. After that, it's a very different country. And, and we don't go out and nobody comes in. So we are a very isolated country. And that's why it's harder for me also to explain things to them. And I'm very happy to connect these people over Facebook around the around around the globe um, well um, I have a boss <laughs> uh, <laughs> who is my wife yes, yes. so I, I I cannot uh, just uh, wholeheartedly say yes let's do it uh, without we'll, we'll consulting invite you with for her. Less, less time first for a vacation <laughs> see how it goes that's right that's right and 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 maybe she will uh, like it as well uh, but um, e it uh, will be very, very interesting to find, as I mentioned before, the virtuous uh, circles that uh, your experimentation is going to create and then reverberate, creating um, curious people uh, who are confident and capable and creating resources so that their ideas can be can be put in place um, you have been working on this uh, in various forms for over 10 years and right now your curriculum is a 10 year old uh, 10 year long uh, eight year curriculum long. eight year eight year long uh, curriculum um, of course, you realize that things will change progressively, maybe potentially even dramatically yes. uh, within the next uh, eight years. Uh, how will you monitor and, and what will you, uh, where will your alarms and alerts are going to be where you know, oh, I have to adapt, I have to change? So in the DNA of the system, I have constantly explained to everyone, uh, if you go for a cup of tea uh, at any restaurant in Pakistan or other countries, there's two kinds of tea available. One's a mixed tea and one's a separate tea. A separate tea comes with tea separately, water separately, milk separately, sugar separately. And a mixed tea comes with everything together. Today, the education is a mixed tea. You come in, you say, this is what you have to do. You don't have a choice. We have made sure that the 25% of the school can be broken by anyone and recreated. It's very variable. And um, I'm sure that every year, especially now, is going to evolve like crazy. It's like, for example, the open AI Soma. It excites me like anything because it's going to finish YouTube. Imagine you can just go on Soma and say, hey Soma, can you show me how to fix this, how to make a biryani, how to make this, how to do that. And it can just literally right there and then make a video for me for a little minute long. And this is just going to just starting a minute long thing and it's going to become five minute, yeah. an hour long. But the how to thing is about to reinvent itself right there. It's right around the corner. And I'm so excited because everything I learn is through YouTube. Mm -hmm. And YouTube is about to go obsolete. I mean, can you imagine YouTube in this age where people are not even using YouTube? Is it about to get obsolete? So yes, I'm very aware that everything we're doing is obsolete. But I'm also very aware that there are some things which will not become obsolete. That's why I introduced yoga. That's why I introduced meditation. 
that's why I introduced networking. You will, the reason I'm here is to strengthen our friendship, is to create more trust among each other, to, to know each other better, right? Over the years, yes, it's fine, fantastic online. We met here and there, but when you come to somebody's house, it change, it's a new chapter altogether. Yeah. So, and I'm thankful for you to invite me. And similarly, the networks I'm building for the kids at this very young age is about the same thing. That no matter what AI comes in, I think it's going to be harder to create the networks, specialized networks. That's why it's so important for us to do one interview every single day, to be able to listen, to be able to talk. And that's not, some, that's not something which Neuralink will solve in the next 10 years even. Mm -hmm. Networking will not be solved in Neuralink. So I'm very aware and I keep, I learn a lot every day. I, I mean, I try to listen to weird things as much as I can so that I can see what's about to happen. I totally agree with you that the technologies that we are building and that are going to be very rapidly deployed all over the world should enable everyone to not only preserve but enhance their humanity and their human relationships. The world is going to change very rapidly. A lot of people will meet the limits of their adaptability and we should enable them to expand these limits so that in a rapidly changing world they still can find a role. And then we mention the relationships between humans because the ways that the world is going to change is going to be driven by artificial intelligence in turn accelerating other technologies and a lot of people will have a hard time finding a purpose in that world when their skills are automated they will say well this is what defined me this is this was my reason for existing now what can i do and so i am now spending a lot of time thinking about and building platforms that aim to enable people design a life of purpose and dignity in a world profoundly transformed by artificial intelligence. Right? So, how do you see your activities evolving in, in, in this uh, scenario? Well, in my network, I think we all live in our bubble, in our network. So, in my network, I see a lot of people moving from uh, educational degrees to skill-based learning. Mm -hmm. And I think that's already obsolete because by the time they will learn Python or web designing or some skill, it's, it's already going to be obsolete. Mm -hmm. And so the one thing which will not get obsolete, I think, is relationship, networks. And I think people should learn that because the reason we hire people is not because they're fantastic at something, it's because we trust them enough, or we know them enough, or we think this is what they can do and cannot do, or they can learn this or cannot learn this, or this is their ability or their not ability, and we will not let that go. And I think relationships are more important than skills. Most people in their startups, they hire friends based on what they think they can do and cannot. If you're, if you're going to climb a mountain with me, if you don't trust me, you're not going to climb a mountain with me. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think people are a little bit mistaken. And I think we should, we should skip this fanaticism about learning of skills because, mm -hmm. yes, you need skills. Uh, you need to learn to drive, but it will be obsolete soon. We know that. Mm -hmm. We need to learn a little bit of Python, but we know it will be obsolete soon. We know all this which is happening. The, the, the challenge is that I think most people do not realize that the 10 years are not going to look like 10 years anymore. The 10 years are going to be look like 100 years. The three years would be like a decade. Maybe a year would be like a decade. So that's where the challenge is. And I think the reason we have stress and frustration and 
is because we don't have those trusted networks around us and we we are fearful of the other to take away our piece of pie but we're not never fearful from our father or from our brother or from our um, sister or from our friends you know sometimes we are but majority of the time we can always go back to our friend and say hey can you give me some work because you know i need i need a job right now so i think we can we will be able to learn at a very quick pace as humans if we don't allow our ego or firewall be in in between our learning phase i mean what's learning i think to be good at something you just need to do it 100 times or 1000 times or 500 times depending on what you're learning right so the reason we don't do it 500 times or 100 times or 50 times is because we stop ourselves from doing it and we think it's too big of a goal so if we if we want to learn python and we start like 5 minutes a day in 6 months time we will be really good at it it's just very very small way of learning we need to really go back to the atomic habits and the tiny habits philosophy that anything we can really learn it just has to be very tiny because the human brain is not really designed for unlearning and relearning so much uh, after a certain age you know at a very young age yes you can but but it's also not that stupid we don't really understand our brain but we still constantly can unlearn and relearn but it takes i think it requires trust it requires love it requires i think trust is basically the the, the main ingredient that will humanity will need among each other and uh, networks are built on trust you uh, you know when we were talking early the reason i came one of the reasons is to build more trust with you to have a very from a small little street to a highway maybe a motorway and then you build more trust and there's a bigger motorway which means that more data can flow back and forth mm-hmm. if there's less trust you know it's like a small pipe so so i think the skill zone is also gone and we are still focused on skill and and it's already being obsoleted and the future i'm very excited about it and i was very fearful about it actually up to the few years ago i was like i was looking for a house where to go and die cuz i thought terminator is coming and everything is just going to be disaster and yes there are 10% of the time that things can really go bad but then the same thing happened when i'm driving or i'm in the plane or when i'm eating i can just choke um i can go to a restaurant and eat food and it could be horrible and i can die just because of that but that doesn't mean that i should not do all those things it's a risk of life it it most of the time it won't happen but it does can happen so i think that the the thing which humans need to get together on is um to build that trust in asap uh, as uh if you might have watched the tech talk between chris anderson of that and um uh, her- noah harari mm-hmm. uh about how the jiangxi river in china uh what it made china come together i think this ai can has the power to bring the world together because look right now uh, the, you know we we just killed 30000 people in israel palestine war and and um uh ukraine and russia were the same 30 35000 people based on rules written by somebody a thousand years ago like 2000 years ago the art of war i think they're still following that rule book but they didn't have facebook live they didn't have youtube they didn't have zoom they could say okay why well, we can't talk to the guy i mean the people should kill or you know really put the person on the leader on the spot if he's unwilling to talk to the enemy i mean today we can just do israelis and palestinians can just do a live zoom call and say hey dude this is how we're going to resolve this if you're not we we shouldn't even allow the the option to bomb someone mm-hmm. one of the thing i'm very excited about i'm i'm probably going to write a book on understanding the past history rules of the war and rewriting the rules for the 21st century because today we have the power to hide in a cave using starling and still communicate to the enemy you don't need to really bomb the guy out you can just afghanistan was totally destroyed for trying to find one guy mm-hmm. what what kind of technology is this good for i mean 
can't the Ukrainian and the Russian guy just talk on Facebook like every day? Hey, dude, how's it going? I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to what? Physically, you shouldn't because mm. it's just a war between two humans. And if you remember in the past, the way the battles were won is that the the champion of both sides would go in front, and whoever kills the other guy wins. And that's how it should be now. I mean, just go and talk it out. Mm-hmm. You don't have to kill the whole army just because the two guys are not willing to talk and they should replace the guy. I think this is wrong. And if if in today's technology we can't communicate, this is a total failure of humanity. Uh, it's it's wrong. Um, the Economist uh, used to have a platform <coughs> uh, that I liked a lot for managing Oxford-style debates where there was a given statement and one side defended the statement, the other side uh, was against it. And then over the course of a couple of weeks, maybe a month, uh, the platform was looking at uh, whether they were able to change the minds of the audience that was following the debate. And at the end, uh, the side would be winning that was able to change the most minds. And um, I don't know why they decided to close the platform. I found it uh, very useful. But uh, I think it is uh, a crucial part of establishing shared uh, trust to establish shared facts and to uh, really hash out differences of opinion in order to find a common ground. And uh, I agree with you that uh, it takes effort and uh, we should be able, thanks to technology, to make the effort in order to achieve the result uh, that, in o- that in turn leads to establishing uh, trust with people that otherwise we would never be able to trust because we wouldn't be able to communicate with them. And now we can everywhere on a, on a global basis, which is really amazing and, 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 and beautiful. Um, another component I think that uh, is uh, important and is part of this uh, view of the future is empathy. Uh, understanding that we share our humanity, we share the challenges, the fears, uh, the failures, uh, that uh, uh, we are hesitant to show to others, but when we realize that uh, we are similar and we have that kind of experience, that becomes easier. And that makes in turn learning easier as well, because as you said, repeating something a hundred times or a thousand times until you get good at it, by definition means that before you get good at it, you are bad at it. And you will make so many mistakes and you want to be in a position not to hide those mistakes. You want to be able to to show them, to share them, and for someone else, not to uh, mock you for that, but to say, all right, buddy, just keep going. I did the same. Isn't this ridiculous? You will, uh, you will get better. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I agree. So, um, do you, 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 you traveled uh, uh, a lot and have seen a lot of cultures. Um, do you feel that there is uh, there are cultures that are more based on trust and cultures that are less based on trust and if that is the case um is there a degree of fitness between different cultures where some are more compatible with a future where trust will be very important and the societies that are 
inherently less able to trust will have a harder time adapting to that future. I'm very excited because technology will allow to build trust because mm -hmm. technology will allow the data points to come out very quickly, mm -hmm. right? So um, AI will go out and make a Facebook profile type profile for anyone. You can just ask, it will just be there. Uh, that wasn't passed. It wasn't possible before. Uh, you had to go and make a Wikipedia and make a page and make a verification. Now we can just ask AI, okay, well, make a profile for David Orban, right? And this is the phone number or make a profile for this phone number. Psst, all that data, which is with the GPT, is just comes on in front of us in, in seconds. That was never possible before. So the societies which have more trust, uh, I would say it would be Sweden, Norway, uh, Finland, these countries, the, Nord the Nordics. Uh, uh, the Swedish government publishes everybody's income online. Tax returns, company profile, not public, but any private company you can just go and see. You can see who owns what in Swedish website. like whatever David Orban owns is now available. Now, if that was done in Pakistan, I would be kidnapped. <laughs> so uh, there are other reasons that, that data shouldn't be published. So the nuances people don't understand, but that what are the consequences of doing something in one country and the same thing which works in one country doesn't work in another country. So uh, you're, you're, her you're, you're serving a hamburger in New York, but you serve the same hamburger in Delhi, it'll be riots because there's cow, cow god all of a sudden, right? So the nuances of, of humanity are very different. But the beauty is this ChatGPT thing, because um, we have it at, at all times. Everybody has it. It's affordable. And it tells the same data to both sides. So the first time I traveled to India, Delhi, I was in front of the parliament and I saw this die giant thing. I was like, wow, that's beautiful. What is this? Oh, we won a war against Pakistan. And that's why we built it. I said, really? But my book says uh, we won that war. Uh, you know, we have a similar thing in Pakistan saying we won that war. How did you win this war? No, dude, this is wrong information. But now all of a sudden we have the same information. Just half an hour ago, I got, a, I got tagged in a post by a boy in Ind Pakistan who studied with us in our one of our institutions and he got an internship in India. Hmm. He's going to do a one month internship in an enemy country where Pakistan spends 40% of its entire budget on trying not to communicate. We cannot make a direct phone call to India. We cannot have a direct airline flight to India. You cannot send post to India from Pakistan. But this guy is now going to have an internship for a month in, in India. <laughs> this is crazy, absurd world we live in. So I hope that somebody out there um, like Elon or, or a private or a government institution needs to really go out and make sure that every human being number today has access to ChatGPT mm -hmm. and knows how to use it. Because all of a sudden, humanity is no longer uneducated. Uh -huh. Entire humanity is now educated. The IQ is same, you and I, as long as we can inquire the question. Or we will have our phone constantly listening on us and saying, <clears throat> no, you, what you just said is maybe wrong. <laughs> you might want to fix, correct and check what you just said is, is incorrect. You might want to check the fact or maybe there we have an Alexa type of device sitting and constantly listening on us and saying, <clears throat> you know, the book you're reading, it has these 10 incorrect facts and it, it's all possible as of right now. Yeah. But we're not invest. We're, we're investing billions and trillions of dollars in so-called university education and school education and sports education. But we're not educating our kids on AI, mm -hmm. our adults on AI. Um, yesterday, I tried to buy a ticket from a Gazetta to Venice, and the woman was shouting at me because she didn't understand what I was saying. What if she was educated? Okay, wait, and just open up the device and say, now speak. Mm -hmm. Or there was this, you know, how much is a phone? 40 bucks, 30 bucks, everybody has internet. Just put a device on every store. You come in and it 
you know, chat GPT and Annie understand every single language on planet Earth. Hello, that's Star Trek, you know, like global translator. When, when, when I am um, uh, traveling uh, and, and I always talk about these topics uh, <coughs> and chat GPT comes up, I always ask them, did you try it? And, and more, many people, almost everyone says they did try it. Uh, and then I mentioned I was in Kenya, so I organized a, a lunch and there were a dozen people, university professors, a future candidate to run the country as a, the president. And, you know, so I asked them, that's great. Did you try chat GPT in Swahili, which is the local language. Or I was in Dubai and I asked the Uber driver who was from Pakistan, did you try chat GPT in Urdu? And, and they, they didn't. They didn't realize they could use it in their local language. Um, so well, what, I, what I wanted to just say was that I wish, and I really wish that hard, that you know, we could go, everything go away, but, you know, we have to grow. Not, we can't have a revolution. We have to go if evolution. Evolutionarily, right now, the thing United Nations should do and humanity needs most is that every human being starts to understand what ChatGPT can do for them. It's the most powerful tool ever invented by humanity ever. And, you know, it's... Microsoft has a gazillion dollars, OpenAI has a gazillion dollars. They should just run ads like 10 times a day, just like they did on COVID. That, you know, stay away from a meter away. Just like the COVID campaign, the world needs to go digital. And people are saying they're scared of AI, but they're scared of AI because they don't understand the power of it. And, and the most thing which will come out of this is that first time in the human history, we'll all have the power to know everything and we couldn't say he's rich because of this guy this thing happened this the knowledge the phds everything is now in in our hands and i think it will be worth for humanity to just go out and know that this is the power they have i was just having a conversation with your wife and she's not very happy with the social networks and you know social media and all that but i think if she understood that this is what she this is what it can help her with her their children or or everything else in life i think we will want to learn this tool because it's so powerful it's like having a genie of the lamp in our pockets at all times it's it's easier than googling mm -hmm. so i it hurts me to see that we have this thing and we're still not using this thing and we're still living in poverty and we i wish we could just put like ads on everywhere 10 times a day so that it goes in it hardwires in our head that before asking anyone any question for god's sake please ask chat gpt yeah don't ask me don't ask your dad don't ask your mom ask chat gpt before anyone and then have a conversation about it that this is what she said what do you think um <clears throat> when um I would, I would ask Peter to put an X prize for that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 when uh, <coughs> um, speech recognition started to become performing in the late uh, 90s, um, I was an extensive user already, and people would call me uh, saying that they wanted to buy a PC for their daughter who was uh, writing her thesis uh, and uh, they wanted her to use speech recognition to dictate uh, the, 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 the thesis uh, rather than typing it. Dragon said, dictate. Yeah, that, that was Dragon naturally speaking actually. And, uh, and I said, great, but I would always um, alert the person uh, that it was important to realize that if you didn't write typing, expecting that you would be able to produce more content speaking was based on the assumption that you had something to say. 
which is not necessarily true. Maybe the fact that you said, oh, I just cannot type fast enough, was an excuse that you needed in order not to realize that you didn't have a lot to say. So going with the speech recognition was dangerous because then you couldn't use that excuse anymore. Mm. Now, what is happening with ChatGPT, in my opinion, is very interesting because people may realize a similar difference between not using Wikipedia, which everyone could already use to find out certain facts, or Google, uh, or using them to a degree that is insufficient, and then moving to ChatGPT, where they would not be able to hide the fact that what is missing is their ability to ask the right questions. And if we can improve that, the ability for people to ask the right questions, not only about the thing they want to learn, but also about themselves, that is going to be, in my opinion, a huge leap. Uh, our introspection, uh, our ability to, to learn not only about the world, but about ourselves, is going to dramatically improve. Mm. And one of the reasons is because we will be in front of this mirror of an AI that is not only very good in knowing facts, it is also very good in explaining things, in giving a broader context, giving reasons for certain things. Mm. And on top of that, it is also very good in knowing itself. And we will be, uh, I hope, not jealous, but really uh, in a very positive kind of competition to say, no, no, we can know ourselves as deeply as that too. As a matter of fact, it can be our sparing partner. It can be our trainer to achieve that degree of self-knowledge. I totally agree. And I think uh, um, if you have tried perplexity and even now in ChatGPT, uh, it prompts you certain questions mm -hmm. without you even asking. Mm -hmm. And I think as it integrates with our body it increases with our watches it create it, it 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 integrates with our email it will prompt us say hey why don't you ask me this question or just like we prompt our children maybe mm -hmm. you know our our parents you know socrates method of asking questions so yeah. maybe uh, if we will program it to ask us questions so that it can find us it can help us find our Ikigai, it ourselves, it our, our all the things. I was sitting the other day and I, I made a small GPT for, you know, everyone to make a million dollars. I made another one so you can find yourself. So through your Ikigai, so it prompts you to find your Ikigai. And what you're saying is, I, I understand. I think, I think as, because it's just the beginning of chat GPT, it's less than a year, a year and a half. It's going to be, I mean, everywhere. So Alexa will be having it, cars will be having it. It's going to function. It's going to it's going to be like a super brain and everything. Our monitor, what we are watching on TV is going to translate us live. It's going to be so many places that it's going to allow the data points which will come in, our health, our body, what we ate, it's going to keep on looking what are, what did you eat today? It doesn't know right now. We have to tell it. But initially in very soon you know, this camera or the cameras in our house will be watching us and telling us, <coughs> you know, I think there will be a lot of <coughs> going on <laughs> around us for at least for the people who want to be, at least I want to be in those places. I don't want to hide. I want to share everything. I, so. in, in Arthur Clark uh, has the famous uh, saying that uh, every technology that is sufficiently advanced is indistinguishable from magic. And, uh, uh, it will be really interesting to be in a world where you can reasonably expect any object to be intelligent. 
Um, the analogy I would uh, make is with maps. Um, we both experienced the time when a map was on paper and uh, you couldn't zoom. You know, as much as you stretched the paper, it, the scale remained the same. It didn't have a search function. All the streets were listed on the back of the paper and you had to look them up in alphabetical order mm -hmm. and then it would give you a square and then you had to find it in the square and maybe, where is it? You, you couldn't find it right away, let alone optimizing a route between two points. Mm -hmm. But that is what uh, maps could do. Now, with the digital maps, we are accustomed to all these functions and many more. How many times we um, go somewhere like you did uh, arriving this morning and say, oh, I'm hungry. What are my options uh, for eating <clears throat> literally around myself? Uh, uh, we extend uh, our ability to uh, look in our environment mm. with so many more uh, valuable data points. So just like as uh, a humble but important object like a map gained incredible new uses by becoming digital, the same it is going to be for every object around us as it gains uh, intelligence mm. and uh, not only observes our behavior, but uh, talks with other intelligent objects uh, in the environment to establish how it can uh, be a valuable component of this ecosystem. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that universal basic income is the right solution uh, for our future social contract. Uh, I am concerned uh, of uh, the government's ability to issue and then to revoke the privilege of being able to eat uh, because of whatever reason and the universal basic income uh, is not uh, like air where everywhere I can breathe, I can walk or travel and I know wherever I am, I will be able to breathe, right? But UBI would be dependent on the benevolence mm. towards every individual of a government forever. However, I also believe that the current social contract that says your value is equal to your own individual economic output and when that economic output goes to zero because you are jobless, you are worthless, is horrible, is not only morally wrong, but it will be also untenable when so many people will make a lot of effort to adapt, but the speed of their adaptability is not going to be high enough and also, sooner or later, all of them, including myself, I don't know about you, we will say, listen, I did everything I could, and I cannot do more, but I still feel that, that I am a human being, I have my dignity, I am worth uh, something. So we need um, a different kind of support system. The same way we have air, which is a wonderful and quite important support system that we rely on invisibly. The same way we can develop an economic support system where the intelligent objects around you um, support you with your needs. And whether that is expressed in a monetary exchange or not is another question. There may be still use for a common denominator. Uh, but um, a, an example I have for this is, I don't know if you saw in my kitchen, I have like seven different containers for the different type of trash. 
uh, uh, glass and uh, plastic and paper and uh, organic and uh, undifferentiated and then there is also you know larger things that I have to bring to the recycling place and each of these get picked up uh, once a week uh, and uh, they are evolving the system so they have started uh, measuring the volume you cannot uh, put out a volume that is more than a given amount and they check it and they fine you if you uh, generate too much trash but the system I have in mind is kind of the opposite imagine a robotic arm like a little robot dog that is ready and eager to pick up any piece of trash that I throw out of my terrace and it is able to immediately evaluate it and negotiate a value for that to be given over to another little autonomous car you know a very small form factor something transporter that comes and says oh yeah I need this basically just by living in the house through the trash that I generate I build the value that at least in part pays for my food or rent or whatever else right mm -hmm. And, and uh, uh, what is interesting, in my opinion, about uh, this uh, scenario is that it is a natural consequence of what you already do. And uh, it is just part of a new um, intelligent digital technological environment. I, I totally love how you're thinking on this. And you're looking for the 2 billion out of the 8 billion people who have already got the house and they have to got the trash and all those. And I'm looking for the people who don't have the house and don't have the trash even. So for example, the reason I am so, and I was so persistent on that people should be educated on how to use this AI is because we have the collective intelligence of humankind already available to all of us. So for example, we are in Italy and in Italy, dried tomato is a big thing and pesto sauce is a big thing. but uh, in Pakistan is not a good big thing. We have a lot of sun, but a lot of tomato, maybe 70% of the tomato is thrown away because it spoils and they don't know that they can actually dry it in the sun. We have a lot of sun for free. We have the tomato for free and it's like a penny a kilo and people throw it out because they don't know, even in today's day and age, they don't know that, dude, you can just dry this, put it in a bag, and sell it on an Amazon store and you will get 10x more money than you have. So that's why I'm more interested that today we have the collective knowledge of humankind available to us. When you say that you want to throw the trash out and there is a negotiation and there is a usage of this trash somewhere. Somebody is willing to pay for that trash. That's what you're saying also. Yeah. And I'm saying the same thing for the tomato. Yeah. I'm saying there's a tomato, the farmer is working hard uh, and he grew the tomato, but he's only selling the fresh tomatoes. He doesn't know that he could just upskill it, up, you know, up, add value to it and make more money. And then that makes more abundance future for us because the more value you add to something or you know that there's a value to something, that's when it becomes valuable because we don't know who will pay us for this trash. So, uh, I, I don't know how frequently, but I often see posts that you make on Facebook where you say, oh, this thing, who makes it in Pakistan? Can I buy a hundred? Or, uh, why, why don't we make uh, this here as well that I've seen uh, on Amazon? Uh, it, is, it is fascinating to see because that is also part of an experiment and a provocation of how to um, stimulate people to be proactive and to come up with ways of creating value and of providing goods and services that can be really very useful locally. But they don't know what they're sitting on. That's, mm -hmm. the, that's the point which, I, which hurts me that today 
we have literally got, I think 99% of the problem which the world has, we already have solution inside chat GPT. Mm -hmm. I think, at least that's what I think. The The problem is that people are, are, are unaware that they have the intelligence to to ask that. And what provokes humanity? Uh, beauty provokes us. Money provokes us. Uh, food provokes us. So, so if we can say, well, you, instead of driving a Toyota, you can have a Porsche. If you just do this, they will be like, okay, tell me, I'm ready. Or, uh, you know, you can do, you can eat this instead of this. If you just do a little bit of this. And since it's AI, it can say, okay, let's not do everything. Just take 1%. What I'm, what I'm saying is that we're living in 2024. We have this collective intelligence to our access. You can today make a device which connected to your CCTV camera and it, ha it is constantly watching and it'll say, hey, David, don't throw it in the trash bag. Here is this guy on eBay who's looking for this. Why don't you sell it for 10 bucks to him rather than throwing it in the garbage? Even today, this is possible. It will take like a millisecond to just show it and it'll go on eBay and look, hey, somebody looking to buy this and it'll instantly say, yeah, yeah, I want to buy this. So there's an opportunity, a marketplace for that trash. Even today, it's possible to do and it's so easy to do and we're not doing it. And that's what I think will happen. And as we connect more people, as we talk to more people, as because we all are thinking similar things in a different way and he has different problems and then this collective intelligence has the power to guide us constantly to evolve and become at least to a balanced planet. Because right now it's it's unfair that one guy has to earn work so hard in New York City and the other guy has to work also so hard 18 hours a day on a piece of land, but the productivity level is $200,000 versus $20 a month or a year. It's just sad, you know? It, and we have the internet everywhere, and we have the cell phone everywhere, and we have the AI everywhere. It's just that the awareness that it can be used is missing. In schools, it's missing. Schools don't allow the cell phone to come in. Schools don't allow the computers to come in. Schools don't allow you to Google the answers. Schools don't answer and say, okay, let's sit with ChatGPT and solve this problem. That's why I built my school. I want this superhuman power, age which is from eight, the most creative age is five. Five to 20 is where the 15 years of, of amazing time where you don't have to worry about your bills, your, your girlfriend, your wife, your kids. That's the peak time of humanity. You know, when you're 20, 22, you have hormones in your body, you need to go out there and hunt, you need to go out and find a mate. All that is missing in five to 50, five to twenty, and that's where I. That's why I wanted to invent this school. That, that's the time of real innovation, not a PhD. A PhD guy is already burned out. He's like, you know, he give me the food, give me the car, give me the house. These kids, they want to just play, be creative, and 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 we don't give them the opportunity. We're not we're not allowing them to sit with these computers, with these AIs, and ask these questions. Right with the facilitator, millions in Pakistan. I think there are like two million or so teachers. One percent of the country is teachers, and 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 they're just wasting their time. They have they have, I I know of fifteen hundred PhDs who are out of job, looking for a five hundred dollar a month job, and they don't know how to use this AI. And I tell them, look, you invested thirty years of your life on something, and you can't even produce five hundred dollars a month. What did you learn? If you can't, if you, after 30 years of learning, you can't produce $500 a month, that's sad. <laughs> that's really sad. So, well, now, fine, it's sad. Now let's move on. Let's move on from the system, which, which was great at one point, which was needed at one point, but now it's no longer needed. Now it's a different kind of planet we live on. It's a different kind of economy we live on. We're all having Amazon accounts. We're all having eBay accounts. We're all having PayPal accounts. We're all having a cell phone number. 25 years ago in my country, you needed to call the prime minister to get a phone line. Today, you're like, please take the line. Please take the line, right? It's a different time we live in. But we're not taking advantage of this time. And that's sad. And that's something which needs to be changed, I think. And I think that's, if we could change this one thing, we have this, and phenomenal institutions, 
phenomenal institutions all over the planet every city has schools and you, and these are the these are the real growth spaces if an elderly should just go and hang out with the with the young guy and just work together that's where the magic happens because you know we this this co this founder of our country his name was Iqbal and he said khirt ko ghulami se azad karte ko peeron ka ustad karte this is a this is a prayer he did 100 or 80 years ago khirt ko ghulami se azad karte khirt is thinking thought please let the thinking get rid of the um, ghulami is like slavery jawano ko peeron ka ustad karte make the kids or the teenagers uh, teachers of the gurus hmm. and today is that time in my school since last one month we were training them to become specialists right the walas i was explaining so i have upwork wala i have remote job wali i have um uh, fiber wala and these people are struggling with these fibers and upwork because they, have, they don't even know how to google they have a skill but they don't know how to communicate mm -hmm. so as part of our schooling now Every kid has to become a teacher for an hour on Facebook Live and YouTube Live. And they have to teach anyone who, who comes and asks so they can educate. They're still not making money for themselves, but the best way to learn is to teach. Mm -hmm. So now they're teaching Fiverr and Upwork and how to find a remote job to anyone. And it just started and I'm so excited about this. In the next 12 months, I will have these at least 20, 30, 40 phenomenal teachers available to the really phenomenal teachers that because they just did not have the AI or internet or so te digital technology link missing. Otherwise, these 1400 PhDs who are sitting in Pakistan and other, I'm sure in Ghana and Nigeria and other countries, <coughs> all they need to do is just use the LinkedIn in a better way. It's just, just they need a we need a small little AI bot who will come in and <laughs> you're looking for a job okay this guy is looking for a guy this I have been trying to make for seven years I have in my head that there should be a human search engine mm -hmm. you're always looking for an amazing guy you said that you need a guy who wants to do the editing and and there are gazillions of guys I'm sure around you who are looking for a guy like you who wants to get edit editing done and you need some some kind of score like so just like the map thing, I think we need like a human map, just like in X X what was that X Men? There's this guy who makes this helmet, and you see everyone. I think that's an app which is missing right now, mm -hmm. where we know everything about you, where you know it knows everything about me, and it it goes and connects. That's why Rihanna Lavala goes out and connects. People see similar things. Okay, we connect each other. Here's similarities. The relationship between students and uh, teachers that was very clearly separated before becomes much uh, more uh, stimulating, complex, uh, richer in um, ways that both can learn, both can teach. Um, I would uh, say that it is uh, similar to what happened, for example, in uh, uh, marketing and communication, where the boundary between what was inside a company and the information that would only be made available through the departments of public relations that would write press releases, and that would be the only way to, to talk and get information out of a company, now with social media uh, and the ability of, of anyone to, uh, to speak and ask questions and analyze data and, and, and see what is going on in a company, it's completely uh, different and, and much more permeable. Uh, what is inside or outside uh, is, is not uh, so clearly uh, separated uh, anymore. So I am looking forward to the spreading of the mindset that is necessary in order to realize what you described. Because there will be, as we already saw, uh, a lot of resistance. And uh, 
the faster this resistance uh, is broken down in a peaceful manner, but uh, decis decisively, the, the better uh, is going to be for, for everyone. Students, teachers, um, they should uh, embrace um, the inner child, uh, the uh, years that you described uh, that uh, are so important for creativity uh, are characterizing humans uh, in a manner that is uh, called neoteny, the survival in adulthood of childlike features, curiosity, risk taking, disregard of authority, and and you know all kinds of um, features that that we recognize in children, and. Uh, a rapidly changing environment is particularly uh, interesting for a neotenic person or a neotenic population because they will be able to map it out rapidly rather than being distrustful of that environment and uh, what is going on. I don't want to, to open the door. I don't want to learn about it. So... Um, being able to be silly, being able to play, being able to um, uh, to to take oneself less seriously are all things that uh, should uh, spread, and uh, and uh, it should be rewarded in some way by society similarly to how a more stable and constant society in the past may have rewarded the seriousness and uh, the authoritative uh, rigid behavior now we need to discard those and embrace uh, our silliness instead i don't know how to do that but you know I keep trying, you keep trying, we all keep trying. And um, I hope the world doesn't explode till the end of game. Uh, well, um, one good uh, perspective, in my opinion, is that uh, the people who played a lot of video games are now adults. So they will recognize the mechanisms and the reward systems and the relative arbitrariness of a lot of rules um, in the world around them because that is what they experienced in the video games. And so they will be happy to play. They will be happy to see what works and what doesn't work. So I want to thank you very much and again, congratulate you for winning the Bold Award for Rehan School. And uh, thank you for coming and, and uh, recording this uh, in my home. Thank you. And all to your all listeners, I would love to connect with them. Please follow me on social media. And also, if you have children or yourself want to be a child and ignite your inner child and curiosity, please join our school. So go to rehan.education and um and we play one hour a day every day games uh just to bond just to talk just to communicate just to see what's happening uh, the kids love it and um, we do a lot of fun and we want to solve the problems of the world and it's not going to be solved with as david said very quickly we need to rethink the way we accept what's normal I, I was once uh, at a newspaper trying to give an interview, and the guy, I, mean, I was, the photographer came and I said, he asked for a photo. And I was like, and he was like, no, you can't take a photo like this. You have to be like this. I said, I'm not going to be, I don't want my article to be published in your newspaper. That's how you want me to be. That's not how, who I am. I want to smile. I want to be happy. I don't want you to be like some guy who was standing. <laughs> And and um, and and yes, we want to live 
in the 21st century not in the 20th century 20th century was amazing it gave us what we are today all the centuries in the past was amazing but uh, um, I was I was reading somewhere or I was hearing someone that what if the 21st century tools landed in the 16th century how will the people take advantage of it they wouldn't even know what to do with it and I think that's what's happening right now for the 21st century that we are we have this amazing tool and we're not realizing how powerful it is how beautiful humanity can become first time in the history of humankind we have knowledge everywhere equally acceptable understandable for everyone in every language oh my god this is this is like you know the heaven and if we if we don't take advantage I think humanity sucks. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure that uh, I hope we will. I there we will, will be variable rates of adoption, yeah. but uh, I am an optimist as you are. So thanks again and uh, see you next time. Maybe the next one will be in Pakistan. Welcome.